Questions of Doom. Hello and welcome back to another Questions of Doom. In this series, as ever, I attempt to answer questions that you send my way using the arkeosoup at gmail.com email address, as displayed on the YouTube channel homepage, but as you'll also see at the end of this video. In answering these questions by video, it is my fond hope that the answer is not only useful to the person who's asked the question, but also anyone else out there who may be wondering the same thing. Now, today's question of doom um, came following a trip to a, a, a local museum, uh, and it goes like this. Dear Mr. Soup, I'm emailing you following a trip to my local museum. Um, there, I saw a range of stone tools from the past 100,000 years. My question is this, how can you tell uh, a stone tool apart from a rock which, ha which has just been broken? My dad wasn't convinced that some of the rocks and pebbles we saw couldn't have just been the result of natural processes. To be honest, neither was I. Can you explain? Thank you, Joanne. Well, Joanne, um, you actually, you actually ask a very reasonable question. I have to say, when I first saw uh, some types of stone tool, I was thinking, well, that, that could have been uh, a pebble bashing against another pebble in a river or in a stream. That's not necessarily a stone tool. And it's true that after a little while, once you become sort of acclimatised, you can sort of learn to see the telltale, telltale signs of, uh, of a stone tool, and in particular, the way that the stone tool was manufactured. Um, and that's really the key to understanding the difference between a stone which has been naturally bashed around and fractured and a stone which has actually been manufactured for use as a tool. Uh, the key is actually, I would sum it up as one word, and that is intent. Um, with a stone tool you can see the intent going into the, the production of the stone tool. You can see um, the, the, the method, as it were. It's not just random. Now, um, obviously, over the over the course of actually more than a hundred thousand years, stone tools have have developed and changed and altered with different types of people. Sometimes they've gone backwards, you know, kind of thing in terms of their development. Um, it just depends on who's making the stone tool, when and how, and what stones they've got available to them, what kind of geology is around them. Um, but broadly speaking, for example, often you'll see the preparation of a stone tool um, in order to make, for example. Um, I don't know, of early stone tools, and even up until the sort of Lavalois, um, Neanderthal kind of stone tools, you'll see um, a preparation in terms of making a striking platform. So that is often the end will be sort of uh, um, struck off a rock to make a nice flat surface onto which you can strike again in order to, to fracture off flakes. This is either to use those flakes as tools or to get rid of those flakes as rubbish and uh, the core of that stone will then become the tool. Depends on what kind of tool the, 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 the striker, the napper, is trying to create. But that's the beginning, is creating this, this nice platform, a good solid striking platform in, with, well, with which uh, you strike, or sorry, to strike it with which you create the stone tool. Once you, once you see a stone which is being struck, what you'll actually see are, are a few diagnostic characteristics. You'll see what's called a bulb of percussion. Um, so when a stone tool hits another, there's an impact. And actually there's a, a, there's a sort of minuscule um, ripple which is created in the stone. It almost acts like a liquid in that sense, but freezes instantly. It's because it's stone, it's not a liquid. But you'll see that the moment of impact, a bit like the centre of a of a puddle, when you when you drop um, a stone into a puddle, you'll see the the, the blop the bloop in the middle. That's the bulb of percussion, and then the ripples which come out from the bloop. Um, that's a very technical term. The bloop. Um, the ripples which come out, they're actually called the ripples of percussion. And again, you'll see them running through the stone tool, running usually on the outside of the, of the finished stone tool. This is where someone's been hitting, and then those, those, the vibrations of that impact have rippled through the stone tool, usually resulting in a fracture or a flake coming off the stone itself. So these are, again, uh, indications, especially if the bulb, bulbs of percussion are, um, say, around the top, or around the base of the stone tool, or if they're, if they're in the same place, this, this will be indication of, of intent. Again, the word intent, deciding, wanting to put the, the strike there, wanting to create this shape using these techniques 
of, uh, and resulting in these lines and bulbs of percussion. Often stone tools will have a symmetry to them and there's lots of theories behind the symmetry of stone tools and I won't go into those um, but they broadly speaking have to do with with, for example, the way that people uh, just like symmetry, symm symmetrical things. But often these will have symmetry, and, and uh, what that means, again, is intent. You, symmetry doesn't usually occur in nature. If you have a symmetrical um, stone, uh, it's more, than, more likely than not going to have been produced, especially if you've got these lines and bulbs of percussion. Um, rivers don't, don't hone a stone down to a perfect symmetrical point, for example, or not usually. Or obviously, obviously it's possible, but it's not, not typical. And there's also different types of stone tool making. It's not just bashing. There's also, also something called pressure flaking, where you apply, often say with a piece of antler, pressure to certain points on the stone tool. This is this is sort of higher level stone tool making. This is sort of later on in the Paleolithic, where people are creating beautiful sort of leaf-shaped arrowheads and this kind of thing, using pressure flaking. It's again it's intent and it's also intent which goes a little bit beyond function this is where it starts to become a design where it starts to become something which is completely um, um, just about beauty and about the form of something not just the function of it but pressure flaking is another way of shaping a stone tool which leaves these these telltale marks where you can see the pressure being applied and then little bits being flaked off again it's intent behind the actions intent behind the shaping um, you also find, for example, what's called debitage, and debitage is a French word which um, was used to describe the, or is used to describe um, where stone tools have been made and the, the remnants of that. So all the flakes which, which people don't want anymore, a little bit like when you're whittling wood, the bits that you don't want to keep just fall to the ground and often they'll fall, for example, in a circle around or a semicircle in front of the person who's been making the stone tool or, or carving a piece of wood. That's debitage. And again, nature doesn't create Debitage. It creates scree, it creates, for example, giant fields of, of bashed up stones and rocks, but not a carefully prepared and, uh, and fanned out little pattern of flaking of a stone tool. That doesn't happen in nature. So again, even the rubbish from the stone tool can tell us something about the intent. This person sat down and they wanted to make this stone tool. Now, there are a whole range of different types of stone tool. You have scrapers, choppers, knives, um, uh, projectile points, um, <coughs> excuse me, sickles, uh, and also bashers or sort of hammer stones. Um, I don't think basher is a technical term there, but, uh, but th th that's another element is that there's, again, with, with regards to intent, is that the stone tools are being made for lots of different reasons, not just one type of stone tool. And this is especially true if you look at the whole span of the Stone Ages, especially in places like Europe, in, in Africa and beyond, um, you can see that, that stone tools are made for a purpose and more often than not they're made very, very, very well for that purpose. Um, so for example, if you come to say microliths in the Mesolithic, these little thumbnail sized stone tools, now often, this is where one of these rules is broken, often they're not symmetrical. But the intent is there in so much as they are little razor sharp blades which can be for example mounted onto say the, the uh, tips of harpoons or arrows uh, or can be mounted onto a stick to create a scraper or so they, they, these are very adaptable stone tool types um, and this is a different type of stone tool but it, it's, it's still got this underlying intent. So whether it's a stone tool designed for one purpose or a stone tool designed for adaptability, such as in the Mesolithic, the intent is clear behind it. Now also, of course, when, the, the, the further you get on in human history, the, the closer to us you get, you also get, for example, in the Neolithic, um, beauty, really, really beautiful. Um, stones and shapes of stones being crafted and created. This is a, a Neolithic axe. Um, and uh, not only is it, is it a tool and is it an elegant design for a tool, but it's also um, actually the stone itself would have been valued, the, the aesthetic of the stone, where it's come from, the colour of it. And places like, for example, the Langdale Axe Factory in, in Cumbria, uh, in Britain at least, um, were, were making these things on a near industrial scale so that, so that they could be shipped out essentially across Britain. Um, those stones were so highly prized um, because of their, their visual appeal 
But again, this, this is something about the intent. It's not just a tool um, in the Neolithic, certainly. They're also something to show off with. They are the latest thing. They are, they are exotic. And these concepts um, are actually really, really useful. Because intent and concepts such as exoticism are actually a pathway to what we call cognition. And cognition is essentially a, a, a fancy word for, for the thinking behind something and the reason for thinking something. So when it comes to, for example, the Paleolithic, we can tell an awful lot about pre-homo uh, sapien homo species, so other species of human being, based on their stone tools, how they're making them, why they're making them. Um, for example, the ability to pass on a design. Could this particular species of homo, could they actually keep the design in their head um, for long enough to produce it? Well, the answer is yes, they could. Then, did they pass on that design to other people? The answer is often yes, they did. So, uh, the, the fascinating thing is that actually the stone tool is not just a tool um, in terms of uh, in terms of the, the the end product, but it's also actually the tool of thinking which results in the end product. This this cognition element of stone tools is extremely useful to us because, as I say, with earlier species, it's all about their capacity, their ability to make something. With later forms of stone tools, such as, for example, in the Neolithic, it's about the elegance of the stone tool. It's about, I suppose, the more the the the, the more um, fringe elements of it. So, for example. Is it beautiful? Will this impress my neighbour? This kind of thing. And, um, and that's exactly why stone tools are brilliant. There's also as well something else when it comes to cognition, and that is um, the pattern of use. Now, and there have been lots of debates and discussions, for example, especially with the Neanderthals, over how what the relationship was between the stone tool, the person making the stone tool, and say the source of the material, whether or not they were, um, for, for example, very strategic in terms of moving around the landscape and only making stone tools when they had the stone available, or whether they moved the stones with them to other places. And this debate, well, did continue for the past 20 years, and I imagine probably will continue um, still. But again, the ability to observe the use of stone tools, the movement of the raw materials, gives you another insight into the capacity, the cognition, the thinking ability, the planning ability of uh, humans and also pre-homo sapien human species, or indeed um, uh, those species which were around with us, such as the Neanderthals. So, um, <coughs> so really uh, important figures in that debate were people like Binford, Mellars and Dibble. And uh, as I say, the debate is continuing, but if you want to, to look those people up, definitely do. They're well worth a Google um, and well worth thinking about because it, it does open up a whole new way of looking at stone tools when you consider them as a concept. When you consider the, de the design of the tool and the ability to create that design, it's just as important as the end product. But anyway, um, I've got off on a slight tangent there, but that's the importance of stone tools. But I suppose that's, that would be the answer to your question. Now, hopefully I have answered your question. The answer is intent, Joanne. Um, you uh, can see that this is not just a random occurrence. This has actually been created for a reason, fashioned for a purpose, and that purpose can tell you an awful lot about the person or the creature um, or the, the, the species which, which, which manufactured that stone tool. Stone tools are incredibly important, and once you can see these telltale signs, both the mechanical signs of actually how it was made, but also as well, once you can start to read the intent behind the tool, you'll never mistake, um, well, you may well, <laughs> but you'll almost certainly, um, very rarely mistake a stone that's been fashioned, say, by the action of water or by falling down a mountain um, for a stone which has been formed into a tool. So there you go, hopefully this has been a useful answer and discussion. Um, I've touched on some of these issues in other videos previously, but never quite this particular um, question. So thank you so much for asking, and, uh, and hopefully, yeah, this hasn't been um, too much of a rambling answer for you. If you have any thoughts or comments, please do comment below, folks. I'm sure Joanne would love to read them, as would I, I always do. And uh, well, as ever, um, thank you again for the for the for your uh, for your question. I mean, these are the, the types of questions that I would never really think to ask myself. So thanks again. Um, as ever, until next time, do take care. Bye bye.